the um, Canadian stress researcher Hans Selye, himself from Hungary, like myself, um, and he coined the word stress, the way we use it today. He said that in the modern world, stresses are mostly emotional. He said, and the biggest stress of all is trying somebody, trying to be something other than who you are. How often are you trying to be something other than who you truly are? Maybe you hide your feelings, make excuses for how you truly feel, or putting everyone else first before your own needs. If you're currently going through treatment of an illness or you know someone who is, has the physician asked you thoroughly about your psycho-emotional life? If you're like most people, then the answer is probably no. With the sharp rise in the last few decades of autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis and in cancer rates, it's obvious to see that mainstream medicine is missing something with regards to why we actually get sick. In today's video, I'm gonna feature Dr. Gabor Mate, who's a world-renowned expert and has decades of experience looking at the role that stress and emotions play in illness and disease. Understanding our emotions is a fundamental pillar to the inner work towards personal mastery. So in today's video, you're gonna learn the missing link in today's modern Western medicine. You're gonna learn the disease-prone personality. You're gonna learn the mysterious power that disease has. And you're gonna learn practical steps that you can start today to empower yourself or the people closest to you in your journey of healing. If you're new to my videos, please click the subscribe button and click the bell. That way you'll be notified each and every week when I release new content. So when you've done that, let's dive straight in with Dr. Gabor Mate. I'm Richard Usaini, here to support you along your path towards personal mastery. And the path being simply the inner work and outer action within your life. On to part one of today's video, the missing link in modern Western medicine. It's important to say straight away that modern medicine has a profound life-saving impact within our culture. The emergency rooms we have access to is one of today's modern miracles. But when we begin to look at chronic illness, we see a medical system that really breaks it down to just a biological aspect, which gives a very limited perspective when we look at illness and the underlying conditions of why we get sick in the first place. In 2017, a fellow Canadian physician, Dr. Norman Doidge, also an, an author, writes about brain and neuroplasticity, said that modern scientific medicine has taken a fundamentally materialist approach and it is analytical, meaning that it divides holes into parts. It often proceeds by reducing complex phenomena to their more elementary chemical and physical components, viruses, genes, molecules. This is a widely agreed perspective when looking at dividing the whole into parts. Now, of course, there are some huge benefits to that as Douglas Rushkoff describes in his book, Team Human. Science's great innovation and limitation was to break things down into their component parts. Science, from the root psi, meaning to split or cleave, dissects things in order to understand them. Now this makes sense, isolate a particular process, make a hypothesis about it, formulate an experiment, see if it produces repeatable results, and then share the knowledge with others. This is how we found out that objects have inertia, the sound has speed, and that plants absorb CO2. These isolated repeatable discoveries in turn make very particular things possible. For example, antibiotics first used by ancient Egyptians, but later refined in the lab, which turned lethal infections into minor annoyances. But to doctors armed with antibiotics, every problem started to look like a microbe. While antibiotics effectively killed their targets, they also helped kill helpful bacteria, compromise the patient's immune response, and encourage the development of resistant strains. Our common sense and felt experience contradict too much of what we're being told by scientific authorities. Science must again become a holistic human pursuit. Medical facts here, and, 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 and you'll see immediately how inadequate and insufficient um, the Western medical perspective is in explaining these facts that I'm about to give you. The first fact is a study that was done in the United States last year, or I should say two years ago now, that showed that the more episodes of racism an American black woman experiences, the greater her risk for asthma. Now, you can't explain that on molecular grounds. You just can't. I'll look at, let me give another fact. 
In the 1930s and 40s, the gender ratio of multiple sclerosis, which is a inflammatory degenerative disease of the nervous system, was a one-to-one. -one. In other words, for every man, there was a woman diagnosed. You know what the ratio now is? It's three and a half women to every man. Now that immediately tells us, A, it can't be genetic, because the genes don't change in a population over seven decades or even ten decades or longer. Number two, it can't be uh, diet, because that doesn't change for a population. It didn't change more for women than for men. Nor can it be the climate. There's something going on. And whatever it is, it can't just be biological. We begin to pick away and start to look at the treatment protocols for conditions such as asthma or MS. It begins to reveal the deeper layers of what's going on. Now, what's interesting is that when you look at how you treat asthma, is you give uh, to open up the airways and to suppress the inflammation that happens in the asthmatic airway, you give uh, inhalers or, 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 or medications by mouth which are copies of adrenaline and cortisol. Adrenaline and cortisol are the stress hormones of the body. They're secreted by the adrenal gland in response to a threat. So there's adrenaline and cortisol. So we're treating asthma with stress hormones. How do we treat multiple sclerosis? If you have a flare-up of your multiple sclerosis, you're going to get an infusion of the st stress hormone cortisol. If you've ever been to a dermatologist with a skin flare-up, some kind of chronic psoriasis or eczema, most of the time you're going to get a steroid cream, a copy of cortisol. If you go to a rheumatologist with inflamed joints or connective tissues, guess what they're going to give you? Steroids, cortisol, in all autoimmune diseases. Um, I could go on. So here's the, the, the interesting question. We're treating all these conditions across medicine with stress hormones, but we're not asking ourselves a simple question. Is it possible that stress may have something to do with this, the onset of this condition? Has something happened to the body's stress apparatus that we have to give people now larger quantities of stress hormone to keep them from having symptoms? And of course, as in the case of the uh, the racism-induced uh, asthmatic attack, we can see that, obviously, emotional factors must be playing a role here. And not just emotional factors, because the, the, the black woman who experiences racism isn't an isolated particle responding to nothing in the environment. She's affected by a social circumstance a social, economic, political circumstance. In my own personal experience, this is something that I'm only too familiar with. I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition and so given thyroid medication to maintain optimal levels. But the question was never asked, why were those levels dipping in the first place? My own curiosity has led me to want to find answers and this is the message I'm trying to get across. There are different ways of doing things and we need to see the whole picture rather than just a, a micro layer to what's actually being told to us to discover why are we getting symptoms in the first place. If we're getting, just getting medication to address symptoms, there are deeper questions. You know, why are we having symptoms in the first place? And what is addressing those symptoms? What is causing those symptoms? Is it just biological? Is it what are the emotional layers? What are the environmental layers? What are the lifestyle layers? And when you start to look at this, you start to pan out and see a much bigger picture going on. Intuitive awareness that, that you can't separate the mind from the body and you can't separate the individual from the environment is not new in medicine. What is new is that now we have the science to actually prove it. And what is remarkable and lamentable at the same time is that despite the scientific evidence, medical practice still doesn't take into account. And let me show you to what degree it doesn't. So I'm going to ask you a question. Here's your hand. If in the last, say, five years or so, you've been to a respirologist, uh, 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 a, auto, uh, a gastroenterologist, um, a cardiologist, a neurologist, or a dermatologist, any kind of an ologist, just put your hand up, okay? Great. Now, thank you. Now, put your hand up again if they ask you about any stress in your childhood. 
One person, that's fantastic, one out of 1,500. Put your hand up if they asked you about any trauma you experienced. Same person, you, you went to a good doctor. If they asked you about your relationship with your partner or spouse. If they asked you about how you feel about yourself as a human being. Same person. And if they asked you about any stresses at work. And I'm telling you, that's how bad it is. Because every one of you, I would say, well, I don't mean too dogmatic, maybe only 98% of you, who went to see one of those specialists went there because of those factors that they never asked you about. If this is new to you, if you've not thought about this before, then that's totally fine. You've not missed anything. This is a chance to begin to open up your landscape, to begin to understand this, and to be inquiry about yourself. And this is what this video is about. On to part two of today's video. The disease prone personality. So I was uh, 20 years in family practice before I did addiction medicine and for seven years I, um, I did palliative care work looking after terminally ill people. And so in my experience I began to notice that there were certain patterns as to who got ill and who didn't get ill. And these patterns just kept reasserting themselves over and over and over again uh, until they became inescapable in, in my awareness. And what these patterns were, I'll illustrate for you by means of some newspaper clippings from the Canadian newspaper, the uh, Globe and Mail, for which I wrote a medical column for a number of years. And these stories uh, from the paper illustrate aspects of what I call the disease-prone personality. One of the main reasons that's got me into this is one, my own condition of my thyroid, but two, I lost my mother to cancer, thyroid cancer. And something during her treatment was just intuitively nagging away at me was there's something is missing from this, this approach. Now I can't fault the doctors in any way whatsoever, but I was just left with this intuitive feeling that more could be done. And now on this journey, I've discovered people like Dr. Gavin Mate doing profound work and looking at the stress or the link between stress and disease. And it's got me asking more questions. Now, my previous career with Olympic sport, that was my job to ask the questions to begin to unlock the limitations from these athletes that I was working with. But applying that into my own life and other people's life, it begins to open up a, a perspective of someone's emotional landscape. Can we die from loneliness? Is there a connection between how we express our emotions and Alzheimer's disease? Is there a cancer personality? The first is a first person story written by a woman called Donna, who's diagnosed with breast cancer and she goes to her doctor and she, she's describing the experience of the diagnosis. What you need to know is that her doctor's name is Harold and her husband's name is Hi. Now Hi's first wife died of breast cancer and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And Donna writes, Harold tells me that the lump is small and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hi's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hi, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, anything... What's wrong with this picture? So here she is diagnosed with a potentially serious condition and her first, and she's the one who might need radiation, surgery and or chemotherapy and the first thought that she has is how will I look after my husband's emotional needs? So this automatic and um, compulsive concern for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for disease. This is a physician who died at age 55 in Toronto. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto's Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. Now, again, if a friend of yours is diagnosed with a malignancy, is that what you would say to them? Go back to work and keep working until you drop? So this, this rigid and compulsive identification with duty, role and responsibility rather than the needs of the self is another risk factor for illness. 
obituary. The second obituary I'll read you is about a woman called Naomi. This is written by her grateful husband. And she died of breast cancer at age 55. And the husband writes, in her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst she could say was fooey or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. Now, um, my wife Ray, I think, is in the audience, and uh, we've been married 50 years this year. And believe me, there have been many times when I wish that she would blend in with the environment uh, in, a, in, a, in an unassuming manner, as I'm sure many of you have who have partners or spouses of any type. But if your partner wants to stay healthy, they will not blend in with the environment. And really what's being described here is the repression of healthy anger. And the repression of healthy anger, we know, suppresses the immune system. And it's literally the commonest characteristic that I've seen in people with malignancy and autoimmune disease. When I say repression, I mean that they don't even allow, some, allow themselves to experience the anger. There was a British uh, surgeon in the 1960s called David Kesson who noticed, just like I noticed, and as many physicians have noticed, these patterns in their clients. And he noticed that he was operating on people with lung cancer. And of course, the more you smoke, the greater the risk of lung cancer. But Kissin also noticed that these people also suppressed their emotions, particularly their anger. And he did some studies, and he actually found that the more you suppressed your emotion, the less cigarette smoke it took to trigger the cancer in you. When you really begin to look at yourself by beginning that inner work, it's really important to do it with a sense of compassion and kindness to yourself. There's no blame here whatsoever. But are you curious about your symptoms? If you're in a pattern of just taking medication to ease symptoms, can you begin to open up curiosity of well, what are these symptoms coming from? And then are you beginning to look at your emotions and how you express your emotions and how you manage your emotions? Are you truly heard within your life? Are you really looking after your own needs? Do you, do you put yourself first at times? And how do other people perceive you? Are you known as charming? Are you known as reliable? Or what other roles or identities are put on you that you maybe unconsciously keep up? It could even be that you impose roles onto yourself that makes it impossible for you to break. In Australia, there was a study. They looked at 500 women with uh, breast lumps that needed to be biopsied. Uh, to make sure that it wasn't malignant. And um, before the results were uh, in, the women underwent a psychological, que psychological questionnaire. And what they found was that if a woman was emotionally isolated, that by itself didn't increase the, romp, the chance of the lump being cancerous. If a woman was highly stressed around the onset of that lump, that by itself also didn't increase the chance of, chance of that lump being cancerous. But if a woman was emotionally isolated and stressed, the chance of the lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. And the researchers, being medical scientists who think from up here, they couldn't figure this one out because they said, how does, nine plus, how does zero plus zero add up to nine? If there's zero effect here, zero effect there, What's happening? Well, of course, it's obvious. And so these patterns of, of, of emotional self-suppression, um, they promote illness in part because they leave us completely alone. Because whether we're alone or not does not depend on how many friends we have. And I'm, again, I'm quoting Bessel van der Kolk. He says, social support is not the same as being merely in the presence of others. The critical issue is reciprocity being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we're held in someone else's heart and mind. But if I'm suppressing who I am, nobody's ever going to see me. And I might be very nice, and there might be a thousand people who love me, but none of them know me, and I'm totally isolated, really at heart. And that's what's going on. When you allow yourself to begin to look at the layers within your life in a way that's not blameful or shameful, it can really open up profound insights. One of the biggest realizations of my own is that how much I used to suppress anger. For much of my life, I suppressed anger. And now anger in, in today's society is often frowned upon. You know, an expression of anger is often seen as mean. 
or not polite or whatever else, fill, it in, fill the story in that you've heard about anger. However, suppressing anger is one of the major causes to illness. But when you start to look at anger, anger is multidimensional. There's a healthy anger and an unhealthy anger. And a healthy anger is simply about setting your boundaries, maintaining your healthy boundaries. Well, you mean anger? Or yes, exactly. So that's what healthy anger is. It's a boundary defense. That's all it is. It says, you're in my space, get out. Okay? There's such a thing as unhealthy anger. The difference between unhealthy anger and healthy anger is that healthy anger is about the present moment. I'm in my space right now, and you, you don't even have to call it anger, just call it healthy aggression. You're in my space, get out. It's when you don't do that, that the unhealthy anger builds up. Until you either totally suppress it, in which case you can get sick, or you explode, in which case you're going to get fired, okay? <laughs> but if you actually, when the boundary invasion happens, you stood your ground, you said, no, I'm sorry, this is not, no, then that's how you deal with it. The role of emotions in general is to keep up what's unhealthy and unwelcome and to let in what is desirable and, and, and welcome. So somebody else in another circumstance, you might want them to be very close with you. So emotions keep out what's unwanted and toxic, allow in what's healthy. What is the role of the immune system? It's the same thing. Now we know that the immune system and the hormonal apparatus and the emotional apparatus and the nervous system are not separate systems. In fact, there's a new science that studies the unity, when I say new, I mean maybe 50 years old, and it's, and it's called psychoneuroimmunology. So the, the study of psychoneurology has, has delineated the actual physiological connections between the nervous system and the gut and the immune system and the hormonal apparatus, um, cardiovascular system, which simply means that when we suppress any part of it, including the psychic apparatus, we're actually affecting the other parts as well. And that's why it's so important to know the distinction between healthy anger and unhealthy anger, because when you suppress the unhealthy, when you suppress the healthy anger, you're actually affecting every aspect of your physiology. Gabor Mate put that so beautifully, I thought, the link that there's no connection, there's no disconnection between our stories and our mind, our nervous system, our immune function. So if one of those are out of balance, it's gonna affect the whole lot, there's gonna be a cascade. So next time maybe you're suppressing some anger, if it's, I mean, the hindsight, then it's done in hindsight, but maybe begin to realize, begin to bring your awareness to the fact, well, if I'm suppressing my emotional side, that's having, going to have an effect on my physiological side. And again, do it without blaming, without shaming. Begin to develop that awareness of like, well, wait a minute, I feel angry. I haven't got an avenue here right now to be able to express it. How can I then begin to express that in a healthy way? And simply, it's how you respond, your ability to respond in the moment. But there's a sense, but there's a responsibility here. By responsibility, I don't mean in any sense guilt or blame. I mean in the sense that if you actually look at who gets sick and why, yes, there's certain patterns and dynamics, certain beliefs that they hold about themselves and their relationship to the world that actually, um, I'm not going to say causes the illness, but, but, but contributes significantly to the onset of the illness. And furthermore, there's another meaning to the word responsibility, responsible, which is response-able. We want people to be response-able. And I can tell you, I know people with multiple sclerosis who once they become response-able, once they look at the flare-ups and what stresses led to the flare-ups and how they unwittingly contributed to those stresses and learn how to prevent the next flare-up, their disease actually is significantly mitigated. And that's what I mean by responsibility. I mean response-ability. On to part three of today's video, the mysterious power of disease. As you know, if you follow me for any amount of time, personal mastery is simply about the inner work and outer action. And that action comes from when we want to make change. And we can make any change we want within our life, whenever we want. However, change often comes when we go through a painful experience. And pain often comes from a disease diagnosis or an illness. Maybe you've had a diagnosis of an autoimmune condition within your life that's forced you to begin to look at your lifestyle. 
Therefore, disease can be seen as an invitation to begin that process of inner work. Certainly for me, that's what's happened for me. My mother's cancer diagnosis and, and process, but also my diagnosis of a thyroid condition. This has sparked me to begin to look at myself in new ways. And those new ways are simply about looking at where I've moved away from my true self. Illness comes along to teach you something. Now, I'm not inviting you to get sick to, to learn this lesson. Nobody wishes that on anybody else whatsoever. What I am saying is that when illness does come along, and then there's many, many people now who, when they did get sick, rather than just simply see it as a calamity to battle against, they also saw it as an opportunity to learn. And what people keep learning over and over again is how they had not been themselves. Illness, illness came along to bring them back to themselves. That's what they keep learning. So, again, I'm not suggesting that anybody should uh, reject um, Western medicine, although sometimes you may want to, um, depending on the circumstances. But the point is that nobody should be a passive recipient to anybody else's care. We need to regain that sense of agency. Is that sense of agency of, of, of actually making the decisions and actually looking at our lives and our patterns and our dynamics and really being courageous about that and being open about it and being supremely curious and not judging ourselves. Oh God, I, I failed, I, I was too nice, I pushed myself down. No. But ask yourself, okay, why was I doing that? And do I really need to do that? Am I still really that infant, a young child, who needs to choose attachment over authenticity? And yes, I may lose some friends who have, are used to me being this particular way, and that's what they signed up for. But my true friends will celebrate me for finally being myself. So if there's a takeaway lesson here, it's get to know who you are and be who you are. And there are many supporting networks out there now inviting people to see their diagnosis as exactly that, an opportunity. One example of that is Cancer Talks, which is a story sharing platform that people can go to really to learn more about how to approach cancer as a teacher, the role that narrative can play in personal transformation and how the extraordinary power of community is always available to support cancer journeys. If you want more information on Cancer Talks, I highly recommend checking them out and you can find their link below this video. On to part four of today's video. The practical steps that you can take right now to enlighten and empower you to promote your own healing. There are some powerful practices that you can begin to use within your life that's really gonna open up the landscape to this emotional side, this psycho-emotional side within you. A good therapist, if you can find one. Not that easy, necessarily. Um, practices that make you more aware so you really pay attention to yourself, some mindfulness practices. Practices that put you in touch with the body. <clears throat> Certain kinds of yoga. Now, I, don't, I don't mean Bikram yoga, where you go to sweat and get into great shape. And I'm not, I'm nothing against that, but that's not going to help with this stuff. So anything that makes you more conscious of your body and of your emotions. I wanted to break this down into three easy components so you can begin to look at this in, in some, maybe some unique ways. The first one is about yourself. What can you do right now for yourself? As Dr. Gabo Mate said, he said about somatic experiencing, and simply that's about coming into your body, feeling, actually feeling. So many of us are disconnected from bodies for various reasons about coming into our body and beginning to understand, well, what are the sensations going on? No matter how subtle, really tuning, tuning your awareness into what's going on. So next time you're angry, and your stories will be going on about your head of why you're angry and what's happened before and all this kind of stuff, Drop into your body, what are you feeling? For me, I feel a contraction, I feel a tightness, I feel burn. They're the sensations that I feel when I'm angry. And then have you got an avenue to express that? As we talked about before, there's healthy anger and unhealthy anger. And unhealthy anger is that steam pot of where pressure is building and building and building because you're not releasing. And so if you're someone asking that question, how do you have episodes where you explode? We explode to someone. Maybe that incident, it's a one-up incident that you just explode out loud. 
that was just the final straw, the straw that broke the camel's back. And if that is, there's no shame, there's no blame. It's just something to be aware of now. It's teaching you. If you have an explosion, it means that there's suppression in there. It's a buildup of pressure. As you progress your skill in learning about yourself and learning about your body and communicating, connecting with your body, a really next step to body scanning will be about how, how then do you express? And a way to express that would be through a breath somatic experience. And so breathing faster and deeper, toning, shouting, giving yourself space in a safe space that you can begin to express those emotions. So next time you're alone at home by yourself, can you set aside some time to begin to shout? Shout into a pillow, hit a pillow onto the ground. Just start expressing yourself in, an, in a healthy way. It's okay to do that. It's in you, it needs to come out. Can you begin to do that in a healthy way? Create time for yourself to begin to do that. Now, the second thing with this somatic experiencing and investigation, this inner work, is begin to ask yourself some questions. You know, do you have, we've already asked, do you have episodes where you explode with anger or do you withdraw? Are you someone that when you get angry, you withdraw from the people that is closest to you? Do you go quiet? You like to be on your own. In which case, how then do you get that out? is that that's probably a, a, a stronger symptom where you're suppressing. And for me, that was my default. It's, that's where the burn comes in. It's a burn because the energy is not being expressed. It's not being liberated. It's being, staying within my body or was staying within my body. The next question I would ask or ask myself would be, are you aware of where you're rescuing others? Now, rescuing means you're putting other people first over yourself. You know, that time where you'll commit to doing something for someone else and you just get that feeling, oh, okay, I'll do it. That's where that disconnect is. Well, you don't want to do it, but you feel you should do it. I'm not saying not be there for people, but I'm saying if you're experiencing that sensation of dread, of heaviness, of you're being drained, your energy is being drained, that is an activity that you do not want to do. And so you're not being authentic with what yourself, with, with yourself. Now, a way of disengaging that would be to be honest. No, I cannot commit to doing this right now. However, I would love to commit to helping you or, or coming to you when, when I can do it or when I've got the energy to do it. Progressing this on, this might mean you begin to let some friends leave your social circle, which is a whole another avenue to personal mastery and the inner work because when we begin to evolve, we all are all evolving, but we evolve at different times. And so quite often friends begin to drop away and that's okay because we'll meet new friends. Two more questions you can ask yourself. Are you aware of the roles and identities that you take in your life that maybe you've had enough of? Maybe you're known as reliable, which means that you've always got to keep up. You don't want to let people down, which means when you set a date, you will put yourself through stress to make sure that you nail that date rather than rescheduling. Maybe you feel trapped. And finally, does the fear of what others think of you keep you in a certain role or identity? An example for me was in my role within sport as a performance coach, I was terrified to leave that because when I told people what I did, I worked for Olympic athletes, there was a certain level of kudos that I got with that wrongfully. You know, I didn't have to be myself. I was not showing up as myself. I was hiding behind a label and behind people I worked with, Olympic athletes, whatever. Only when I began to look at that and then begin to work on my own and free myself of that role and identity that I'd put on myself, became this huge freedom of doing work that I now loved, full, you know, fulfilled with. So that's just an invitation to you. Are there roles and identities that you're inhabiting that you don't want to be in anymore? The second area we're going to look at is about being a parent. You know, if we're not aware, we begin to put our default patterns onto our children. But we have another need that's also important in the long term. And that need is for authenticity. And authenticity means knowing what you feel and your guts and being able to act on it. Just how long as an organism, a creature, survive out there in the wild, if they're not in touch with their gut feelings. We have these two important needs, attachment and authenticity. 
out to the self, being in touch with ourselves. Now, that's fine. But what if you're two years old and your mother doesn't give you another cookie before dinner, so you do what a two-year-old does when they don't get another cookie? You throw a tantrum. And then you get the message, good little kids, don't get angry. You might even be punished. So the message that the angry child gets is not that good little kids don't get angry, but that angry little kids don't get loved. No, what I, said, what I told you was that the attachment drive is not negotiable. If I get the message that my healthy anger, which is just expressing how I'm feeling, is unacceptable and threatens my attachment relationship because I'm going to lose the parent if I do it, what do you suppose I'll do? What do you think is going to get sacrificed? The attachment? Impossible. In every case, the authenticity is going to be uh, sacrificed, and now we become separated from ourselves. And I'm not saying that your parents meant to teach that to you. I don't doubt for a moment that they did their best, but that was their best because of the way this society raises children and stresses parents. The result is a lot of people who are completely disconnected from themselves. So the invitation here is to, the first part is to bring awareness and how do you react to your children when they're having a tantrum? And again, some questions to ask. Can you maintain a level of awareness with them? So when they're kicking off, they're screaming, they're rolling on the floor, or they're doing whatever a, a toddler does when they have a tantrum, can you maintain awareness? You're gonna have an elevated state, of course, and that's okay, that's completely natural. But can you see that they don't understand how to express their emotions or that is the way they're expressing right now and that's okay because that's their very primal way of doing it. The second question is, can you allow them to express their feelings? So when they're being angry and they're shouting and they're kicking screaming, can you see that as they're not playing up, they're just allowing, they're just processing. And for me, how I see my three-year-old daughter is that they are at their purest, aren't they? And so they're allowing their emotions to come through and then they return to baseline. So quickly they can be, one minute they can be losing it, the next minute they're back to their baseline happy and joyous. And to me that teaches me, my daughter is one of my biggest teachers, that teaches me that if we allow our feelings to come through, we can return to a baseline rather than suppressing because we're maintaining a facade for our damaged society. Another question you can ask is, can you be there with love even though they are kicking and screaming? Maybe you can hold them, make them, you can just sit by their side and just hold that space, allowing them to just go for it and know they know that you're there when they need them. And finally, just to say that this is the first place to start. I'm not saying that I, I you know, don't have enough of it, I don't, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, I'm not at all. But this, using this as, a, as an evolutionary practice for yourself and for your children. And finally, partners. And this is a really interesting area. I'm very grateful that Anna and I have committed to each other to use our relationship for our growth and to allow, to free ourselves as much as we can in this lifetime. The, the true self, the authentic self, is never lost. In fact, there's a very interesting word that we use when it comes to illness or addiction. What's the word that we use when people get better? they recover. What does it mean to recover? It means to find something. Well, if you find it, it means it could never have been lost in the first place. So I think that healing is always, well, I don't say always. I mean, at a certain point, people are diagnosed at terminal stages where nothing they're going to do is going to relieve them of the burden of illness. But often, 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 becoming conscious, becoming, having some agency in your life can make a huge difference. If we only supported people in doing so. Now, let me go back to this question of women and multiple sclerosis, which I may have left, I just recall, as an open-ended issue in your mind. Um, why do I think this gender ratio has burgeoned that, that way? Because women have always played the role of being the emotional stress absorber, absorbers of their environment. So they tend to take on the stresses of their spouses and their families. They still play that role, for the most part. But on top of that, 
since the 30s and the 40s, they've also taken an economic role. But they have not given up the other role. It's not that they haven't given it up. Society hasn't relieved them of it. The men haven't stepped up, for the most part, to, to, to share that emotional burden. So women are still carrying that. But now they got the economic role as well. And they're doing so in the context of less social support, because there's all kinds of reasons why they're in this neoliberal um, economy and, and this stressed culture, people are more and more isolated. So you've got more stress, more isolation. Of course you're going to have more autoimmune disease. And so about 75-80% of autoimmune disease actually happens to women. To work with your emotional partner takes courage and vulnerability, and there's no doubt about that. When you can do that, when you can begin to set up the environment to be vulnerable, it offers absolutely profound insights and connection between you. I'm not saying it's easy all the time, it's not. But the more you can practice it and the more you can develop that, it opens up really tremendous things. And here are some questions that you can ask yourself and begin to maybe set a date night and begin to ask these questions with each other. So the first one is, how often do you have open conversations with your partner? How often do you truly check in with each other? Or do you just get in after a day's work, you cook dinner, put the kids to bed, or if you haven't got kids, just cook dinner, sit in front of Netflix, and just do that for a few hours and then go to bed. Again, this is just inquiry, it's all it is, just an inquiry. The second question is, do you check in with your partner to see how each of you are truly feeling? One, truly feeling in the day, truly feeling in that period of year maybe, truly feeling within your relationship. And I say opening up the doors to this is a vulnerable experience. But if you can truly tune in, how are you doing within our relationship? And just to be there and to know that this is gonna be uncomfortable, but to guarantee each other that this is a safe space to do this. Because the more vulnerable you can get and the, the more honest you can get, this can begin to iron out and to help you both grow. And ultimately, you know, if this is not the right relationship for you anymore, you can both be set free. Another question you could ask is, are you aware of the wounds that you bring to your relationship that may be contributing to your dynamic? It's very easy to blame others, to be the victim and to blame others, but when you put the spotlight on yourself, and think, okay, well, wait a minute, what am I contributing to this? Because all we can control is ourselves and our inner world. We cannot control anyone else. It's not for us to control anyone else. We can't. And so if we really take a deep, honest look at ourselves, we begin to see that, okay, well, this is where I play out my old patterns. And all of a sudden you'll start to see, oh, that's coming up in this situation and this situation. And then when you see them, you can begun to begin to heal them. Just remember to be kind, kind to your partner, kind to your children, and most importantly, kind to yourself. This is a powerful process. This is an uncomfortable process. This is a vulnerable process, but this is also a very profound process to go through to open up life in incredible ways. The connection you'll have with your children, the connection you have with your partner, and the reconnection you'll have with yourself is something that I cannot say strongly enough. Because we live in a culture that is forcing us to suppress our true nature, to become isolated from ourselves, to become isolated from the people we love, even though we're there every single day. And on a larger scale, we're becoming more and more isolated from nature. Our connection is being severed more and more. The research is there. Being asked to suppress our fundamental leads of authenticity and connection is leading us to become sicker and sicker. Over to you, how has this resonated with you? Has this given you some questions to ask yourself? Have you got some insights from this video? I would love to hear, please comment below. And it also helps other people to see your, see your story. The more we share, the more the community opens up and the more we can take value from each other. And I wanna thank you Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and remember to look at the links below because there's some valuable resources for you to check out in your own time. So thank you again and see you on another episode.